<laughs> okay, so the last hour. We're going to talk about program access and existing facilities, okay? So this is, you know, a lot about what we've talked about. You know, we've talked a little bit about it, but we're going to talk in more detail about it. <laughs> When um, the city or the county or the state builds new facilities or buildings, they need to be designed accessible, right? Absolutely. But I can tell you, no building is ever perfectly built. It's never happened, never will. And that's because you've got so many people in the mix. The architect could design it perfectly, and then the contractor doesn't quite do it right. The contractor will say, oh, a little inch or here, two, or, you know, doesn't really matter. And it doesn't sound like much, does it, an inch? But if you're talking about the inch in a grab bar, it could be the inch between making it work and making it dangerous. Because an inch might mean that it's too far from the wall, and if it's too far from the wall, if your hand slides and you're transferring maybe from a toilet onto the chair, if your hand slid behind it, you can break your wrist because you're putting all your weight on it and you have no other resources to give you stabilization and your hand slides back. And I've actually had that happen. I didn't break my wrist, but I came dangerously close at not being able to recover from it. Um, so an inch, even as small as it sounds, can make a huge difference. And contractors don't really get that. You know, they don't get some of the standards and requirements. So things are designed accessible. They never quite usually all make it into the accessibility realm like we would. Um, some of the accessible features we need to think about. Parking lots. And garages have accessible parking spaces that are designed and reserved for people with disabilities. We now have a new standard for vans, which is really cool, and I love it. You know that van spaces traditionally are double wide with a standard access aisle, with the, I mean, the, we're a little bit wider, but with the, with the wider access aisle, because the expectation is you've got a lift on the side, and that happens to be what I have. Um, for the power chair, I've got a lift, and it needs it comes off the side, so I need that extra wide space. What they have done in the new 2010 standards, which is fabulous, is because that access aisle, that striped mark, is the size of a parking space, people have a tendency to want to park in it. And that means that if you are using a van with an access vehicle, and it has the lift on the side, you're stuck. You can't get in or out of your vehicle because somebody's parked there. So to combat that, what they did now is they had the standard access aisle as an option. You can do either the old standard or the new standard. But it's got the standard access aisle, and the rest of that space is in the parking space. So depending on where you get in and out of the vehicle or where you need it, so you can back in or head in, then you position yourself within that space to get that extra space for the access aisle. So nobody, people kind of get that small access aisle they don't because they, they're not going to park in this parking space, you know. But the access aisle just seems like a space to them that's designated for them. So it's a much better, much better design for van users because there's less likely for people to be parking on the access aisle. And you can position your van anywhere in that space. So that's pretty exciting. Also, for really small parking lots, you know, the standard always has been you have one accessible spot. But if you've got, if you've got four spaces and you've got one accessible spot that, you know, may or may not be used ever or just occasionally, Businesses were saying, that really is a hardship for us. So what now is, is allowable in small parking spaces is that you don't have to label it as such. It's available, and it's designed so it's accessible. But if it's not labeled, it's not a legal spot. So anybody can park in that spot. 
but it is accessible for people who need the accessibility feature, which is a really cool thing because, you know, if you're a small business and you're in a setting where your parking is critical for your success, for your survival, and if you've got three spots that everybody can park in and one that only gets used occasionally, if ever, depending on the business, that really limits your ability to get business and draw them in and keep them. So that's a, a really cool, some new features in the 2010 standards. Um, as we talked about, sidewalks and pedestrian roads are designed to be sm uh, smooth and level. They've got really gentle slopes so that people using a variety of devices, and we talked about the standard earlier for, um, for a ramp, um, and what is that? Anybody remember? Right, one in 12. So for every inch of height, you need 12 inches of slope or ramp. Make it easy. We need to have accessible fire alarm systems, right, that are both audible and flashing to alert people with vision or hearing disabilities along with everyone else. Those are standards in the ADA. Um, easy to read signs and, and um, things that have braille characters as well. So on this sign, it's a little hard to see, but you have the raised lettering. So for somebody who, as we talked about earlier, may have been um, uh, like, just like somebody who, who was deaf and later in life doesn't use an um, interpreter because they never learned ASL, the same thing happens for somebody who was blinded or lost their vision. As you know, we know as we get older that you know has the ha the ability to happen. You know, you start wearing glasses and have needs. So rather than just having braille, which is required, we're also required to have raised lettering so you can feel the F L O O R as opposed to knowing braille. Oh, you had a question. This was back for the, um, the fire alarm system. So what if you're in a high-rise building and you're on the eighth floor or something and there's a fire alarm or a drill? What are you supposed to do if you're you know, in a wheelchair? You're not supposed to take the elevator. Right. Great question. And if that's your workspace, then as a workspace issue, as an emergency evacuation procedure, we're on the, um, on the fourth floor. Um, of a high-rise building. And so we have a strategy in place. So we all have each other's cell phone numbers. So I've got Stacy's and I've got the rest of the team. So our evacuation plan is someone stays with me, the rest of the folks go down, and let someone know that we're, you know, that we've got two people up on the fourth floor and we're um, staying there. Actually, we're on the fifth floor. Um, we're on, you know, whatever floor, and once the building is evacuated, we go into the stairwell. The stairwell, when the doors are closed, is a two-hour safety area. That's a requirement for all buildings. So I know that, you know, unless there's a fire in the stairwell, I'm safe for two hours. What usually happens is they don't evacuate me. They know I'm there. If they need to, they'll come up, and it's never happened, um, and let me know. And or they'll clear the elevator shaft to make sure it's OK, and they'll take me down on the elevator shaft. So 9 out of 10 times, or 9.5 out of 10 times, they will, they will put me in the, in the elevator and bring me down. So they cleared the building. But once they, you know, because it's rarely is it in the, in the, the elevator shaft, they do that for an abundance of care, right? Because the last thing you'd want is a huge elevator full of people that, you know, became a fire trap for them. So that's a safety feature. But they, the fire department, when it comes on site, has the ability to override that. So you have strategies in place. Other, the other strategies that can be used are um, evacuation chairs um, that are a lot of times you'll see hanging on the stairwell walls where they can transfer me into that, and usually one person can then by themselves take me down a set of stairs. So there's lots of other strategies. 
And um, the Virginia Assistive Technology System has a great training on emergency procedures and evacuation using assistive devices. And evacuation chairs are one of those devices. And it's strategies about how to get out of Title III entities and, and, um, and also uh, offices. So if that's something you're interested in, please contact them. They would love to help share that information. Did that answer? OK. Um, Any time that a, that a building is being renovated or remodeled, accessibility um, needs to be modified as much as possible. But there's still going to be sometimes structural areas that cannot be done because of load-bearing walls and those kind of things. Um, so how do you accommodate that? You do it by program access. So if you can't do something physically, um, because under the ADA structure, physical modifications is the last thing. As you saw, we can move programs. We can do a variety of things before we're required to modify a physical structure. That's the last one. And it, it, it was done that way because it was so expensive, right? So you can modify a program by repositioning it to somewhere else. And if you can't then reposition it, then you offer alternative services. So like um, county offices, um, county services offer dental services to two different, you know, um, in uh, a building that's the sec on the second floor and there's no elevator. And the building isn't required or wasn't required when it was built to have an elevator. If it's a medical service on the second floor now, it would be if it was a new building. Um, but you can't really bring down dental services much um, to the first floor, right? That equipment's really heavy. Those chairs are really heavy. So you can't just relocate it like you would a counseling service. So what, it, what are their options? What would you suggest? Any ideas? Could you contract with uh, another dentist? Get somebody, you know, we can't do it, but we have somebody you can go here, and their office is accessible. The perfect solution. You would do that as a one-off. You know, if you couldn't get me to the second floor, then you would say, Marianne, you know, Dr. Smith, two blocks down, has a fully accessible office. And we will pay for the services that we would have offered you here. So I'm getting equitable service, right? And it's accommodation. Ideally, you know, it'd be great if you could give me the same service in the same office. We can't right now. Um, it could be that, you know, it's a rural area and there's just not that many opportunities for buildings that we can do. So in the meantime, as a stopgap, you're going to send me to Dr. Smith. Absolutely. So we're going to look at, Stacy's talked about, the holistic approach. When you look at things in their entirety, um, we're going to make sure that we're making the program when viewed in its entirely, entirety. So it may be that if you've got a bunch of programs and we'll talk about them, you want them dispersed. But there's a variety of ways that you can make sure that that happens. And some of the ways are things like, the equipment, you may have different equipment. Um, you saw the bowling ball. You know, that's a way to make bowling accessible for folks who can't pick up a bowling ball and throw it. Um, that's one way for them to participate. Providing assistance, we've talked about that. We talked about, you know, the map readers, having somebody that would interpret maps and things like that, that would be a great way to interpret things. We just talked about relocating programs or activities to alternative um, accessible facilities. Making home visits. When all else fails, if it's that kind of service that can be done, you might have to make a home visit if you can't get the person to the facility because it's inaccessible. The last thing would be alter existing facilities or build new ones. Now, that is the most efficacious way to do it. You know, if we're in an, a, an accessible facility, we don't have to think about it. We don't have to worry about alternative supports. But in lieu of that, we can do all of these other things. The priority here is integration. 
And that was a reason why I was kind of challenging before about, you know, you'd want to send somebody who had a service animal to the medical shelter. Um, because that person doesn't need that level of care, right? They just are bringing their service animal in. Even, you know, maybe a wheelchair user, as long as the bathroom and things are accessible, I don't need medical support, I just need an accessible facility. Um, so we need to be really cautious about um, wanting to schlep people to the medical you know, that's kind of a medical model that we're getting away from in, that, in the integration with people with disabilities. In recreation, um, you know, you've got, let's say, two baseball programs. Um, you've got the standard baseball program, and you've got beeper ball. And beeper ball, for those of you who don't know, do you, wanna, do you know beeper ball? You're nodding. Just a ball that beeps. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a little more than that, but essentially, it's, it's baseball designed for kids who are blind or with disabilities. And so the ball, it's a bigger ball, and it beeps, so kids who are blind can hear the, the ball coming at them, and they have a better shot at trying to hit it. <clears throat> and then they have a runner that goes along with them, because they're not going to necessarily know how to get to first base. So they have a, a runner that accompanies them to the bases and tells them when to run when they're on bases. So, so you've got a, a, a kid who's blind who wants to participate. The county can say, we've got beeper ball league, or they sometimes call them challenge leagues and all kinds of things. But he could say, but you know, all the kids in my neighborhood play in the neighborhood <coughs> team. I want to I play there. You can't say, uh-uh you got to play in the challenge league. What you might have to say is, well, you know, we would, you, we, we don't offer beeper ball as part of it because that would do what? What is the term we've already used today that would mean a change in that program? Fundamental nature of the program. Fundamental alteration, you bet, exactly. That would fundamentally alter the game that everybody else is playing, right? If we're going to say we're going to make a do a beeper ball, because that's not standard baseball, right? That's not going to get them to a little league championship in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So we can't do that. But how else could somebody who was blind participate? Well, come on, I know it's after three, but any ideas? Could they be scorekeeper? Could they be a manager? Could they be, you know, any other kinds of things? You know, equipment manager. This is kind of the part of it. Well, yeah, you know, there's that old line about, you know, we, I was working on the um, Raven Stadium, making, we, I was on the team that helped build it. And we, um, signage you saw has Braille on it. So the coaches, Locker room has braille signage on it. And somebody commented on our um, thing, well, that's appropriate. <laughs> and somebody else said, why would it need to be brailled? And this is because it's a standard. It's not that they might be using the braille. But it was pretty funny. <coughs> so we've talked about some of the alternatives already. You know, making a home visit, doing a telephone interview, emailing. Um, some assistance. There's lots of ways. Again, be creative. Remember, the ADA forces us to be creative, thinking outside that box. But we want people to be as integrated as possible. So we can't keep them in separate silos if indeed we can make everything fully accessible, which is our goal. So court proceedings, now the jury box is fully accessible for folks. It used to be that you'd have to sit outside the box on the floor. Not, not really talking about integration, is it? You're on a different level. You're probably sitting next to the defendant. Not something you may want to do. You know, not appropriate. There are some 
some things that we want to do alone, like voting. You know, somebody who is blind should not have to have two voting judges go in with them so that nobody influences them when they're reading the uh, ballot. <coughs> that's, not, that's not a good strategy. So now voting. We've got a voting law that requires there to be accessible voting for everyone. So we've got absentee ballots, we've got books by mail, we've got all kinds of things that people <coughs> want to do separately. We're looking at facility-specific programs. Um, so we've got to have the chemistry class in the chemistry lab, right? <coughs> As I said, the jury needs to be done in the court. You're not going to have somebody on a jury remotely. We don't want specialized facilities that we don't need them as much. We want to provide the full access as we can. Um, obviously, we still may need to relocate things, although they're going to be more, a little more uh, limited. The alternate site must be comparable to what is available at the inaccessible site. The dental office, like I said, is, is one example of that. So here's an example, though, about that integration that we talked about. We've got 45 playgrounds. 25 of them are fully accessible with the routes and equipment and everything. And they're scattered throughout the county. So it's relatively convenient for folks to get there. They're open the same hours and days, and they have the same type of equipment as the inaccessible. This county's um, programs are, you know, accessible when viewed in their entirety. But County X is 45, only three of them are accessible. Okay, so when you compare them with the inaccessible play playgrounds, it means that somebody may have to travel 35 miles to go to um, nearest playground that's accessible versus one that may be five miles away. That program, even though it offers some accessibility, would not be considered accessibility, accessible because when viewed in its entirety, 35 versus 5 is not accessible. Um, I have a question about this example. So does that mean the county would be required to upgrade some of these playgrounds? Yep. If there's limited resources in a county, <coughs> You want them to upgrade playgrounds rather than, I mean, how do you decide if you want to upgrade the playground or make the school, every school accessible or make, I could see if perhaps a new playground had to be accessible. I just, does ADA say every facility of every municipality and government entity must be accessible as a whole? Well, that's obviously not what I'm saying because we're saying that we're not going to make you make 45 playgrounds accessible. But when viewed in its entirety, this is a reasonable standard. We're saying that 3 out of 45 isn't reasonable because people are traveling 35 miles to take their kid to a playground where they can play. That's not, that's not a good, good resolution for accessibility. But obviously, a county with limited funds is going to want to juggle. So, you know, we're going to maybe not make all schools accessible, but, you know, relatively speaking. So we're going to use that when viewed in its entirety, standard, and juggle. So maybe this year we're going to add three more playgrounds, and we're going to do them strategically. So we're going to get that mileage down to 15 miles. So we're not saying you have to make 45, as in the other example we didn't, and we said it was accessible. But it is a challenge, and I, I, I don't, you know, having worked in government for many, many years, I, I'm not minimizing what the challenge is, but we are saying that this is not an accessible when viewed in its entirety. Yeah, and I don't, I don't mean to be a cynic about it. I just, absolutely, I think anyone would agree this is not good. I just didn't know if ADA required this to be fixed or just, hey, as a guiding principle, when you're doing additional playgrounds or updating them to do the right thing, you should make more accessible. This is beyond when you're upgrading and when you're building new ones. This is proactively saying, you've only got three. This is inaccessible as a standard. You have an ongoing obligation 
beyond what you're upgrading to address this issue. Separate from, when you're upgrading or building, that's the done deal. It has to be made to the, to the new standards. This is saying you're going to take a part that you never anticipated touching, but because of the inaccessibility of when viewed in its entirety, you're going to have to look at this and make it accessible. It's that proactive need that you have to do in addition to new facilities that is a standard in the ADA. Counties, as well as um, Title III entities, have that obligation, an ongoing obligation, to increase accessibility outside of renovation and building new. And a lot of people don't understand that standard, and it's a really important one. Um, so improving facilities, um, you need to make sure that there are other efficient and effective ways to achieve that accessible integrated programming that we just talked about. So you've got some alternatives, um, but you know, doing the structural changes are sometimes the best way. It just makes more sense, even though you're not required to do it. Um, so less staff involved in trying to relocate, um, make changes, juggle. You know, if it's all accessible, you don't think about it, it's just done. And it's not a problem. We just talked about anything that you're building new um, has to be done accessible. That's, that is the requirement. Um, so here we got 25 out of 40 playgrounds for M County. They have a fairly accessible program, but when they build a new program, it must comply with all the new standards, even though they're already fully accessible systematically. Anything new has to be done. Historic buildings. That's something that people always say, oh, no, 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 you, we can't touch historic buildings. And there's some hysteria involved in historic. Because people say, oh, it's historic, we can't touch it. Well, Williamsburg has done a really great job, although they still continue to get sued on little pieces, but they've done a really great job. When you consider the enormity of what they're looking at in the historic nature of making things accessible for people with disabilities, but you can make facilities accessible. You just don't have to do it to the level where you're going to destroy the historically significant features of that facility. So if it's a if it's a two-story um, home that is significant in nature, you don't have to put an elevator in there and destroy it to make it accessible so I can get up there. But how else might you be able to provide access to me at that second floor? Video tour. Video tour. Absolutely. Give somebody an iPad and have that, you know, already programmed in and I can look around and see what's what's up there. You can bring maybe artifacts down for me to be able to see just like everyone else does that are up there. You know, I should not be expecting you to destroy the historic nature so I can get upstairs. But there are other ways to do it. But if you're saying, oh, we can't have a ramp to that building, but you put stairs in that weren't there originally? Really? I think not. I think there's ways that we can do it. Um, I worked at the, in the Maryland Governor's Office and we made the Maryland Governor's Mansion accessible. Um, the front steps were like most mansions, right? The gorgeous Georgian front steps. Um, but I had to go through the kitchen because that was the only way it was accessible. Well, that's not exactly the exciting way. You want to go to the Governor's Mansion, you know? And we designed um, switchbacks on the side of the steps and bricked it to the front of it just as, as the same brick that the rest of the building is. And when you look at it now from the front, you have no idea it's accessible because all you see is the bricks. And hidden behind those bricks is a wonderful accessible path. So now I can go in the front door just like everybody else. And it blended so well that we had to put signage up there to say, yeah, it really is accessible. 
It doesn't look it, but honest, it is. You can come in this way. So we have a sign at the front gate and at the edge of the ramp so that people know that it really is. So it can be done well, and just because it's historic in nature does not mean you don't make it accessible. Historic buildings are ones that are not just old buildings. You know, everybody <laughs> says if it's old, it's historic. No, no, this has to be listed on the National Register to be exempt under some kind of standards for not making things accessible. But even then, as I just said, there is a standard that you must still provide as much access as you possibly can. You can see this, this setting is, is one near our office. Um, but you can get up close to it, even though we're not going to make it fully accessible. The doors are too narrow. But you can get up and around, and they've worked on it to make it accessible for folks. Right-of-ways. Um, we need to make sure that our path of travel is fully accessible. So, and that's requirement for county government and city, state government. The streets and roadways need to be accessible for folks with people with disabilities. And there's whole standards now for right-of-way um, compliance. And there's more being developed and, and promulgated soon. So we really need to look at things like this bus stop. You know, here's somebody that was unable to get to the bus stop because there was a curb. Well, they made a nice little modification, right? And got it to, there's no sidewalks there. But in order for somebody to get to the bus stop to be able to be safe, rather than sitting out in the middle of the street waiting for the bus, not a good situation. They put a curb cup in, in and a walkway to that, that bus stop. The other thing we, we need to worry about, and it's really important to think about, people forget about maintenance. You, gotta, you put these features in, you got to maintain them. So that if the, the ramp is crumbling, that's not safe for somebody in a walker or in a wheelchair that may get stuck. So you have to repair those cracks. You have to keep branches out of the walkway. Sometimes branches are, you know, make the walkway so, t so ter narrow that literally I can't get through in the wheelchair, that I'm being, like, assaulted. Um, because of the way it's done. And most people don't use that one because it's the wheelchair accessible path and not the standard one. So they don't bother making any changes. Or uh, by us, where we get a little bit more snow, they don't clear the snow. Or they'll put all the snow in the wet spaces. Exactly. The accessible parking spaces. Nobody's going to use them. Thanks, guys. So that means I'm surely not going to be able to use them, right? So elevators need to be repaired quickly. Grab bars, the assistive listening systems, all of those. Uh -huh. I'm just going to toot the horn, horn of Virginia Beach. The Virginia Beach Mayor's Committee on Persons with Disability just did a review of all of the bus, bus stops um, in Virginia Beach, we have it itemized down what the number is, where it's located, and everything that needed to be done to it to make it accessible. The maintenance, needs grab bar, whatever. And we've ha we had a, a subcommittee that went out and looked at everything, and I just saw a copy of it, and it's gorgeous. So you've got it all there, and if it's, I assume it's the city's responsibility to fix them. They got a guideline. They don't have to go out. And, or wait for someone to say, hey, it's not accessible. We've given them a review. So I think that's a step really in the right direction, too. And that's also, awesome. Yeah, cool. Kudos. <clears throat> now, things are going to break down, right? <clears throat> that just happens. But those repairs or corrections need to be done as quickly as possible. And then you need to figure out what going to happen in the meantime. So you can't just say you can't, you know, you can't get to the second floor to go to the dentist. Well, if you have a dental emergency, something's going to have to happen. So you have to have plans in place. It's not acceptable to say, oops, oh well, elevator's not working. So here's an example of the elevator the city pulls out of service for several months due to renovation. 
to facilitate access, the city created temporary accessible parking, installed a buzzer, posted signage, and provided a staff cell phone number in case of problems, and waived fees for individuals who had to use this. So they went above and beyond. They didn't have to waive the fees. But what a nice little, you know, gee, we're sorry that this is kind of a pain for you, understand it, we can't do anything about it, but we're going to compensate for your, you know, for your hassle by waiving your fees. Does that cost the city much? Yeah. You know, it's minimal, but it, they went above and beyond. What a nice way to tell me you understand that this is a pain for me, but, you know, we're working on it. Again, the, the city or the county doesn't have to take um, action that fundamentally alters the program or would cause an undue, undue financial or administrative. Now, we talked about financial being, you know, really, really high standard. Administrative may be something else that may be a really tough standard. So it could be that administratively you can say that can't happen. And it might be that... If um, you said that um, there was a course you wanted to take and it was computer-based and it was designed um, for um, PCs and you use a Mac and you said, well, I can't take the class. You have to redesign the whole class and make it Mac because that's what I use, and I'm a person with a disability, so my needs trump? Not so much. You know, there's no, that would be, you know, that's apples and oranges, really, right? Because Mac commands are nothing like um, PC commands. They operate very differently. You'd have to hold different instruction. Everything would be very different. So that's, you know, that's financial, but there's also that administrative burden that, you know, it's a whole different animal. So financial burden is pretty high, but administrative burden would be something that may be more likely to have happened. Um, again, we talked about the fundamental alteration must be done by the head of that agency. So it's not just a program person that says we can't afford it. It has to go to the highest level of that government. And if you can't, for whatever reason that undue burden exists, what are the alterations? What changes can you make? What can you do differently? It's not acceptable to say just, no, we, we can't do that. Where else can you go? What other options are there? And there almost always is some other option. So here are some of the resources that we thought would be of interest to you. The Department of, the, of Justice, DOJ, administers Titles II and anything related in employment to a government. So if it's a, um, an employment issue around a state or local facility, it would be handled by the Department of Justice. If it's a if it's a nonprofit or a business, um, complaints would go to EEOC. But also EEOC has all the standards for employment in general, so that would be covered by Title II employment as well. So EEOC is where all of the standards we talk about. You can read um, resources around the ADA Amendments Act, the standards of reasonable accommodations, all kinds of resources. I mentioned earlier the Job Accommodation Network, right? JAN is a wonderful resource. It's run out of West Virginia University. It's been around for, probably, well, it was before the ADA. So it's probably been around for 30 or more years. And they've got a huge database that is wonderful, providing all kinds of accommodations. You can go to askjan.org. And it, you can type in multiple sclerosis. And it will show you all the, all the kind of ways that somebody with MS could be accommodated. It's got a great, great search engine. So they've got webinars, just tons and tons of resources. 
So I really encourage you to check it out, you know, before you need it, because I think you'll be amazed at the kind of resources. We work real closely with Jan doing things. Um, we talked about um, VATS, the Virginia System Technology <coughs> System. Um, they've got um, Recycle Assistive Technology you can look at. Um, they've got resource centers where you can go and look at them. You've got loan programs so you can borrow things and check it out before you purchase it. Um, they have a, a program called AT at Work that shows all different kinds of accommodations that can be done um, using um, assistive technology in employment settings. And they also have, as I mentioned earlier, the emergency preparedness um, program that they've been doing the last few years, which is really good. So check it out. Check out their website and see all the great resources they have. I think you might be really pleasantly surprised. The Access Board is the group that covers, they develop the accessibility standards. So they're the ones that, that you know, decided that doorways were 32 inches wide and that um, aisleways were 36 inches clear and that uh, ramps were 1 in 12 and all of those other kind of standards. Bob? Use the mic. Um, you want to grab a mic? <laughs> did they still make the ADAG books or did they stop? They stopped making the ADAG books. They don't do anything um, in, in print anymore. In fact, uh, hardly any of the, print, uh, the resources are in print. ADAG was the old ADA accessibility guidelines. Um, that, that were um, somewhat, well, in, built upon with the, 20, the new 2010 standards. And they used to have these great books. They were half size and they were gray. And they were really, really useful out in the field. Um, we're considering um, printing some and having, and having them be um, wire bound and selling them on our website for you know, essentially what it costs us to get them out of the door because there are still a lot of people who aren't using them on their pads or their phones or whatever. They still like the hard copies, so that is something we're considering doing. Are they federal or state? It's a federal standard. It's the ADA standard, yes. For the Access Federal. The Access Board is a federal agency that developed the ADA standard. So they developed the standards and then the Department of Justice or the Department of Transportation adopts them, or Fair Housing adopts them. Um, but they develop it as a standard. And then those federal agencies say, yeah, we agree, and or we'll tweak it to make it work for us. Um, some of you may be ADA coordinators in your um, in your agency, um, and there is an ADA coordinator training program, and, and Stacy just finished it last week, um, and it talks about how to be an ADA coordinator. It's actually um, a course that gives you a certificate um, afterwards, so you attend trainings like this, and you would then get a certificate from us saying that you attended. And, and how long it was, and there's certain areas that you cover. And then you could go to our conference and take sessions, and those are valid for certain categories. And what it is is it just allows people um, kind of the background and skill set to say, look, I took this additional coursework to be certified in knowing what Title II and what the ADA talks. So for some people, it's great to have that other certification to be able to show their bosses that, you know, they have this other skill set that is indeed documented. Um, we are one of 10 centers as part of the ADA National Network. So you can have somebody call the 800 number anywhere in the country, and it will be routed to wherever they live. So if uh, you live in, if you have a cousin in Atlanta, you can give them the phone number, and they'll get the center in Atlanta. 
Um, or in Nebraska, they'll get the Great Plains Center. And that's important because, because we're regional, we know the players in our region. You know, Shirley reminded me, she and I were at a training around the ADA 23 years ago. Um, and so Shirley and I have been communicating ever since. But when she saw me yesterday, she said, oh, your hair's gotten so white. Because <laughs> I haven't seen her since. We've just communicated by phone and email. <laughs> uh, but we've worked together a lot at doing trainings here in the region. And I've been down here and just haven't seen her. Um, but we know the players. And Bob and I had done training years and years ago. So we know, you know, we know people. If we were national in nature, <coughs> there's no way we'd be able to know the resources and, and play upon them as we do. But the ADA National Network has got a lot of things that we've done collectively with the other nine centers around the country. So there's some great resources there at ADATA.org. And then, of course, our center. And on the sign-in sheet, you identified if you wanted to get our e-bulletin or our newsletter. Our newsletter just came out today. We do it three times a year, and it's free. And the um, e-bulletin is twice a month. And the e-bulletin comes out, and it's got all kinds of things that are happening, timely things that have happened in the last two weeks. And it could be court cases. It could be resources. It could be trainings. We do a lot of webinars. Um, they're listed on our website. We do them in our own region, and we also collaborate with the national. So there's legal webinars. There's ADA accessibility webinars. There's arts webinars and recreation webinars. There's employment webinars. Um, we got a ton of things. And all of those webinars are free if you do them through the computer. And if you call in, some of them may have a fee attached. But almost all of those kind of trainings are free. We also have um, our conference that we, that we do every year, a major conference. And this year, it's going to be September 17th and 18th in Baltimore. The registration is online. It is a two-day intensive training. We have all the Fed agencies coming, the US Department of Justice, the Access Board, the EEOC, and the Federal Department of Transportation are all coming and presenting what's new and latest in the last year. We've got 20 breakout sessions. And we have a free pre-session that is um, somewhat similar to what you just did today. But for people who need an update, it's a half-day session that walks people through the whole ADA. To kind of remember, you know, after you do things for a while, you forget some of the nuances around what the ADA really is and what it's all about. So that's coming up. We would encourage you to consider coming and or um, sharing that information with folks. Um, we've got lots of materials and resources. Um, and as I've been talking to some of you, if you've got questions, you know, this may bring up more questions than answers when you go back and you start sifting through all this information and you look at the PowerPoint again once we get it to you. Um, you may have questions. Call us. We're there to support you, to help you understand the ADA. We think we're better than the federal agencies in several ways. And the federal agencies would probably agree. Well, I know Department of Justice agrees with us. They recommend people call us all the time. Um, and that's because the federal agencies will tell you what the law says. They'll say, oh, section 123.2 will say this. And they'll tell you what it is, and they'll explain it a little bit. But we go to the next step, and we'll tell you what the resources are and what your next steps are, what you need to consider. And then maybe who to talk to in your community or what resources. <clears throat> they wouldn't probably tell you that if you're looking at EEOC, probably wouldn't tell you if you were talking about needing an accommodation that you should be looking at VATS. And we would give you VATS's phone number and how to reach them and what kind of things you can expect from VATS. Or, you know, to make sure that you talk to DARS and you get, you know, the training programs that they have, or the support to making sure you know that. And we could probably give you the name of the person to talk to. Um, we try and at least go that next step so that we never, and if it's not an area, like I said, you know, ADA is like Kleenex, um, 
40% of our calls are not ADA calls. But people reach out to us because they don't know where else to go <coughs> or because we answer the phone. What a novelty in today's world. So we help people get to the next step. So we don't ever say, no, we don't do that, click. It's, hmm, fair housing, let me tell you who to talk to. Or right, that sounds like a, an issue that the Independent Living Center might be able to support you on. Here's how you get a hold of them. So we get people to the next step, even if it's not an ADA issue. So call us, visit us at adainfo.org, and let us know. And we do trainings, as you see. We actually show up on site. We also do, as I said, a lot of webinars. And we've got online training. Um, there is a Title II ADA Coordinators course that is online, that is free, takes about three hours, and it reviews all the requirement for Title II folks and what they need to do. So that may be a great, you know, for those of you in Title II entities, a great refresher about some of the things we've talked about today. So lots of ways to get information. Check out our website. It's chock full of stuff. We're gonna be, we add new stuff all the time. As I said, we've got two brand new products that we'll be unveiling next week. Check them out, the video and the accessible meeting guide. And we've got new resources on customer service training that we're gonna be adding. So please check us out. We also have an adahospitality.org that talks about resources for hotel and restaurants um, that we think is really great. So if you have issues around those, wanna learn more, wanna share it with people, go to adahospitality.org. And our two websites are being updated, and they'll be released within the next week or two as well. So it'll have a new look and feel with new information. On. So if you're used to going to us, come back and check us out. We're going to look real new in a week or two. So with that, we're Marion and Stacy. Um, let us know how we can help you. Any last-minute questions? things that still aren't clicking that we haven't addressed or that we can address for you. You're just exhausted. <laughs> That's fair. Um, we ask that you do the two evaluations that are on your table, please. One for the um, disability board and one for us. On behalf of the board, we appreciate y'all coming out here. We certainly appreciate y'all coming down and sharing with you uh, what you've done for the last day and a half. Uh, keep in mind, as uh, Stacy mentioned earlier, our next uh, plan and training will be in October. Um, so there'll be more information will come out. I think if we've got your and our registration, that y'all should get a notification of it. So something that you should please uh, keep October in mind. Uh, again, a reminder for the, the surveys are very important to us. Uh, if you just leave them on the table, that's fine. Or, or any of the people back here, they'll take them as well. So again, unless there's something else, we appreciate y'all coming out. Be safe going home. Thank you.